Uh, good afternoon. I, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, I'm privileged to introduce this afternoon's keynote speaker, Dr. Ma Martin Nye, a professor of National Natu Natural Resources Policy and director of the Bull Center for People and Forests in the WA Frank College of Forestry and Conservation at the University of Montana. For 20 years, Dr. Nye's research and teaching has focused on public lands and wildlife policy. He is author of The Governance of Western Public Lands, mapping its present and future, and recent recipient of the University of Montana's Distinguished Teaching Award. As appointed by the Secretary of Agriculture, Dr. Nye served from 2014 to 2018 on the U.S. Forest Service's National Advisory Committee for Implementation of the National Forest System Land Management Planning Rule. Please join me in welcoming this afternoon's keynote speaker, Dr. Martin Nye. Crowd and karma, I guess. No? There we go. I think it's one. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah? Okay. Okay, sorry. Okay. So a Rorschach test. This is a weird way to begin, but what but what do you see here? <laughs> what is the personal and professional lens through which you viewed this image? There's going to be a lot of reading over the next half hour, so let's get comfortable with it. What do you see here? What is your interpretation of this language? This is where I'm going to start my primer of multiple use law and politics. 1960, with passage of the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act, the law that governs the management of the national forest system. What do you see here? The older, the younger woman? Are you someone who can see both? Someone who can see one but not the other? Same thing. Or this? I cannot see the rabbit. I have tried over and over. I see the duck. duck. <laughs> Last one. So my point here is that at the outset is that we continue to view multiple use management in law and politics in disparate ways. While some of us may interpret multiple use to mean primarily economic use, like timber and grazing, the two words out of a 570-word statute. Others, like me, point to all of this sort of language, non-impairment, future generations, the American people, judicious use, coordinated management. And we bring into this interpretation our own personal and professional values, interests, baggage, blind spots, and so forth. And once we see something or interpret something in one way, it can be hard for us to unsee it. So my plan today is to selectively cover a huge expanse of territory, a flyover of the political and legal landscape of multiple use. I'll introduce some major themes and landmarks, the sort of general topography. I'm going to do it sort of chronologically, mostly thematically, definitely subjectively. Because just like you, I see all of those images with my own baggage, my own history, my own personal preferences. I'm also going to pause along the way to emphasize some major themes and take-home points of multiple use management that I'd like to return to later. And I'm also going to introduce some additional public land laws for comparison and contrast, but mostly to show you how multiple use management has been shaped mostly by non-multiple use statutes and larger political and institutional forces. So I'm obligated to begin here 
with the utilitarian roots of the U.S. Forest Service and the multiple-use concept, as articulated by the founder and the first chief of the Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot, who stands here with President Theodore Roosevelt. Now, as I'll show you soon, this, is the, this continues to be the most dominant and popular interpretation of multiple use, one that emphasizes the wise utilization of public lands with an emphasis on timber, grazing, and mining. Another reason that I have to introduce Pinchot at this point and the foundation of national forest law is to introduce you to the 1897 Organic Act. As we'll see in the next 20 minutes or so, agency discretion is a major theme of multiple use. Chief Pinchot wanted discretion, carte blanche discretion, to assert his vision and authority over the national forest system, and he got it in this very discretionary statute which until 1960 governed management of the national forest system. Now in comparing this act, the Organic Act, with the multiple use law, one can make the case that multiple use was in fact a sort of course correction for the Forest Service with Congress nudging the agency to take these other values into account, especially outdoor recreation. So for the Forest Service and the BLM, our story today begins with a lot of administrative discretion. Now fast forward to the 1930s and 40s, some 15 to 20 years before we even get the multiple use law codified. And what we see in the 30s and 40s is a pretty vigorous debate going on in, in Journal of Forestry over these different uses. The fault line was essentially between those who viewed multiple use in a way similar to we view agricultural production, with some uses or crops dominated in some places, this sort of mosaic of dominant uses that are both spatially and temporally separated, and then this counter view where multiple use means simultaneous use, a more systems sort of view. So this literature raises two issues to consider at this point. First is the dominant use versus multiple use framework that is as relevant today as it was in the 1940s. And the second is that multiple use management principle was being practiced on the ground well before passage of the Multiple Use Act. Now back to the multiple use law, which includes this provision which complicates our understanding of multiple use and foreshadows a pretty significant development, which is passage of the Wilderness Act in 1964, four years later. This law created the National Wilderness Preservation System with a mandate to protect wilderness character of designated units. And today, roughly one-fifth of the National Forest System is managed under the Wilderness Law. So I point this out to introduce two additional themes that are important in understanding multiple use. First, we see Congress reducing coverage of multiple use management, the acreage on which multiple use management is applied. This is a trend that begins in 1964 and is ongoing today. Slowly over time, the amount of land available for the classic sort of economic utilitarian multiple use has shrunk. The second observation is that Congress quickly questioned the discretion afforded to the Forest Service in the Multiple Use Act and takes some of it away, establishing a wilderness, a wilderness law wherein the Forest Service has much less discretion to manage for wilderness than it did under multiple use. And these are two important and still relevant themes to today's debate. Now, another significant development, passage of NEPA in 1969, National Environmental Policy Act. Now, this has obvious significance because it fundamentally changed the process by which multiple use decisions get made and are provided their due consideration. There is no doubt that NEPA procedures, along with the forthcoming planning statutes, bureaucratized, formalized, and in some cases, democratized multiple use allocations and decision making. Now, this took some time, but flash forward to 1997 in the Comwash case, 
where for one of the very first times the BLM was held to account for its decision to graze the canyons of the Comwash allotment without considering or analyzing in NEPA any other relative values of this area. Now back to 1970. I said it's sort of chronological. And we get the results and recommendations of our last Public Lands Law Review Commission, whose work set the stage for the multiple use oriented uh, Federal Land Policy Management Act, which governs the Bureau of Land Management. But multiple use was criticized and rejected by the last Public Lands Law Review Commission as it recommended a variation of dominant use for public lands. Again, one of the dominant themes in this debate. That same year was a watershed moment for the National Forest Service. At this point, the Multiple Use Act had been codified for 10 years. And while the intent was to broaden the Forest Service's mission and mandate to provide a course correction for the Forest Service, there was instead a remarkable increase in the amount of timber harvesting taking place on national forest lands, like here in the West Fork of the Bitterroot. With terracing practices like this, a very common practice. And this is when my institution got involved at the request of Senator Lee Metcalf of Montana, who requested the School of Forestry and Dean Boley to investigate the Bitterroot controversy, provide recommendations for its resolution, and it became known as the Boley Report, and set the stage for the National Forest Management Act, which I'll discuss in a moment. So I'm going to stop, for, I'm going to go through a couple slides, and I'd like to you to read some of these passages, including this very first sentence of the Bully Report. Last one. That's not just a shameless plug for the Bowley Center. Uh, so why, why ask you to read all of this language from a rather old Bowley report? because it emphasizes another important theme in the multiple use story, that a discretionary law like multiple use is often no match for larger political and institutional forces, such as both the Congress and executive branches using their authority, like the appropriations process, to get out the cut on the bitter root. But just how discretionary is multiple use? Is there any there there? Does the mandate to give due consideration to five prescribed uses mean anything of substance? At this point in 1971, the law was already being criticized as a, quote, vacuous platitude, an empty slogan, and so forth. But what would the courts have to say about it? We get one of the very first answers in 1971 in a case regarding management of the Tongass National Forest in southeast Alaska. Now, the Sierra Club challenged an $8.7 billion, with a B, board foot timber sale, which is a long-term sale that encompassed more than 99% of the commercial timberlands in southeast Alaska. For context, consider that 2.6 billion board feet were harvested on all National Forest System lands last year. So would such a sale be allowable given this new multiple use statute? The District Court of Alaska said yes. The theme here? Judicial deference and agency discretion. Let's do another. <laughs> 
another often cited case. Here, two ranchers challenged the Forest Service's ability to reduce the number of livestock on a grazing permit. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals for the first time was presented with the argument that the multiple use law supplied standards that could be applied in judicial review. But the court didn't bite, again viewing multiple use as requiring deference to the federal agencies implementing it. Multiple use, said the court, breathes discretion at every pore. Yes, that phrase is awesome. It's a sort of drop the mic moment for the Ninth Circuit. Let's do one more, a more recent vintage. The Forest Service's 2001 roadless rule that generally prohibits uh, road building on 59 million acres of land, roughly one third of the national forest system. In its rulemaking, the Forest Service explains how the protection of roadless areas squares with multiple use, as the statute makes clear that some land can be used for, all than le for less than all of the possible resource uses. Again, this is part of the law that some interests cannot seem to see, just like I cannot see that rabbit in the image I showed you earlier. Now, the state of Wyoming and others challenged the rule, in part arguing that it contravened the Multiple Use Act. But once again, the court rejected this argument. Now, I've said nothing so far about multiple use on BLM lands and the multi, uh, administered by the BLM. I'm going to skip to FLIPMA to save time, but it is important to note that the first multiple use law on BLM lands that guided their management while Congress decided whether to dispose of those lands or to retain them in federal ownership was the Classification and Multiple Use Act of 1964, which tracks the, the Forest Service's multiple use law closely, but prescribed additional uses, just like FLIPMA does. So again, FLIPMA is very similar to the multiple use law, at least in terms of its multiple use definition, but more multiple uses are listed, many of them environmental in orientation. The law for the first time references future generations and requires these lands to be managed without permanent impairment. Multiple use allocations and their due consideration are to be provided according to FLIPMA in this new planning framework, where in theory a more rational balancing of relative values can take place. That's comb wash. Multiple use is also bounded, to a degree at least, by two more substantive provisions found in the law. The requirement to give priority to areas of critical environmental concern and the requirement to prevent unnecessary or undue degradation of the lands, with an emphasis on the word or. While these provisions in FLIPMA are important, the bounding or the sort of cabining of multiple use is much more apparent in the context of the National Forest Management Act, which is laid on top of the multiple use statute for the Forest Service. Like FLIPMA, multiple use is to be operationalized through land and resource management planning, which is to be done in accordance with NEPA. And equally important are all the substantive and enforceable constraints found, found in this statute, with the sharpest perhaps being the mandate to provide for diversity of plant and animal communities. And this is a significant theme in the evolution of multiple use. It is now more bounded and more constrained by these substantive and enforceable laws. Now, of course, NIFMA is but one of these statutes. Another is the Endangered Species Act, a law that has fundamentally changed how multiple use is practiced on Forest Service and BLM lands. And what has shaped multiple use the, the most are substantive laws like these. In a way, they have instituted a sort of de facto compatibility framework on public lands, requiring multiple use to be compatible with these substantive and enforceable provisions. 
So let me return to the illusory nature of multiple use in its contemporary political context and speculate a little bit about the paths or the forms that it might take in the future, all for discussion purposes. So one option is to see it mostly as political filler, that vacuous platitude I referenced earlier. You know, at this point, multiple use still makes for good special interest group politics, and it is still very much a political currency. Okay, here, for example, is an exchange uh, between Senator Murkowski and Interior Secretary nominee Sally Jewell. Mur Murkowski begins with um, a rather odd assertion that recreational shooting is one of the prescri statutorily prescribed multiple uses. Whatever. <laughs> Stay focused. Um, but anyway, you want the job. So how do you respond to the senator? You don't mess with the senator from Alaska. So you respond like this. For the record, I added the smiley face. <laughs> now let's jump ahead to the confirmation hearing for Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke. Now, this quote deserves its own talk, um, and I'm not going there, but few secretaries invoke multiple use more than Secretary Zinke, but he does it in a coded sort of way. Take this exchange, for example. Like it's always been, multiple use is a great way to avoid saying no and to avoid making the trade-offs that are inherent in federal lands management. So I'm in Utah, so I had to go this next pathway. I felt I was obligated to do so. And this is another relevant interpretation of multiple use, which comes from those advocating for the transfer of federal lands to the states, such as the case here in Utah, the case made by the American Lands Council. Now, while transfer advocates in Utah and especially in Montana politically embrace multiple use management, they reject the premise on which multiple use management laws are founded that these lands will be managed for the American people and in the national interest. And this is how the American Lands Council answers that question, which at least they do here in a straightforward way. Second, transfer advocates advocate a state trust land approach to multiple use. And this is why they so often contrast the, the purported inefficiency of federal land managers with the trustee-based paradigm at the state level. That is the essence of their efficiency or inefficiency argument. But here, for instance, is how multiple use is defined in the Montana Code for state trust lands in Montana. Yes, it is a multiple use framework, but one that is vastly different than found at the state level. As you know, what comes first is the constitutional obligation to generate revenue for a beneficiary. And that is explicitly rejected by Congress in the Multiple Use Act. Okay, another possible pathway for multiple use is what I'm calling the make multiple use great again option. <laughs> this is the continued emphasis on just one part of the multiple use law, the two words in a 570 word statute. And this continues to be the emphasis on some in industry, not, notwithstanding some of the case law we, that we just uh, looked at. 
those focused on requiring increased economic utilization of federal public lands, a more aggressive and industry-focused version of multiple use. And this is the view held by all of those interests making up the Federal Forest Resource Coalition that challenged the Forest Service's latest 2012 planning rule. And the coalition argued that the rule's provisions related to ecological sustainability, ecosystem services, species viability, not outdoor recreation, but the rule focuses on sustainable recreation and the requirement to use best available scientific information to inform the planning process. The coalition argued that all of these provisions were in violation of the Multiple Use Act. Now, the coalition lost on procedural and standing grounds, but once the rule is fully implemented in, in, in plan revisions and the projects hit the ground, we may see the return of this argument. Now, this pathway could also possibly be cleared with new public land law as we certainly see lots of legislation seeking to unbind and unleash one particular view of multiple use and to make sure that its management is no longer encumbered by NEPA, judicial review, and those substantive laws I just referenced. Now, a completely different pathway for multiple use is now being provided in the revision of forest plans happening throughout the country, most of them being prepared in accordance with the new 2012 rule. This is where we could potentially see new and innovative approaches to multiple use, all created in a more bottom-up, science-based, and participatory fashion. We live in a very different place than in 1960, and as we lose so much non-federal land to development, our public lands become increasingly valuable. So maybe a long shot, but perhaps new life can be given to multiple use in the development and land, in land and resource management plans. And perhaps it is here, unit by unit, that new concepts, principles, and science can be grafted onto multiple use. Now finally, I'm asking us to consider what we might learn from the collaborative endeavors and place-based initiatives happening on federal public lands. I thought this would be a good way to finish because if you recall, in 1960, Congress mostly codified a concept and practice that was already being shaped on the ground and was already being vigorously debated. Now, I've written about some of these developments. I've examined these place-based initiatives and, and some of the collaboratively developed recommendations that are going on throughout the West. And one of the major themes to emerge is the search for more certainty and predictability on multiple-use lands among a variety of interests from conservationists that are pretty fatigued about fighting the same battles over and over again over vulnerable lands, to the timber industry wanting a more steady and predictable stream of timber. And so when you look at these agreements, one thing that seems to jump out is the use of land use designations by these groups. Not unlike we would see in a forest or range plan. Lines on a map where these groups have identified stewardship areas or restoration zones where timber harvesting is allowed with parameters protected land designations, and even agreements about contentious travel management decisions, motorized, non-motorized. So viewed through this lens, it seems that multiple use framework is indeed still relevant. What's changed, however, is the process by which these allocations are being made with groups no longer trusting the agencies to do multiple use. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nye. We have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has questions. Yeah, 
Yeah. Martin, you, <clears throat> you, know, you have multiple use, 1960. It's hanging around for some time, right? It's kind of in the shadows. And then um, the gentleman talks about, well, how do we get the northern spotted owl crisis? How did we get this incredible increase in timber harvesting on Forest Service and BLM lands and private lands in the region? And instead of focusing on the northern spotted owl, I, I, I focused on the bitterroot controversy because it happened so closely after multiple use. And why I thought that history was so significant answers your question as well. Because a discretionary law like multiple use is no match for these larger institutional forces or, and organizational values. That's one of the beautiful things in the Bully Report, that they talk about Congress exerting its power on in this unwitting Bitterroot National Forest, and we still see a lot of those power plays going on. But he, they also challenged the sort of professional dogma within the Forest Service, the way they viewed citizens as antagonists. And really, this ushered in this whole participatory, collaborative framework that we're seeing on federal lands is something that the Bully report won it. Um, so I think that's, that's the best way. And of course, what we've seen in the Northwest is the implications of the National Forest Management Act. Right? That, that case began as a NIFMA viability claim and then became an Endangered Species Act lawsuit. So it's those substantive enforceable laws that were the catalyst for the Northwest Forest Plan, not multiple use. But the counter view, of course, right? I'm going to just debate myself over multiple years. That's what I've done for a couple of weeks putting these together. Do I have anything interesting to say about multiple use? I won't go there. I'll let someone else other than myself ask me a question. <laughs> Do you want do you want to answer that one? <laughs> oh my lord, seriously? I'd be running if I could answer that question well, I'd be running for office, I think. Um, <laughs> well, I would say that multiple use does have you know, we had this discussion at break. Um, you know, multiple use has it's the, in the vagueness is a problem, obviously, the, the ambiguity of the statute. But the counter argument is that it provides sufficient latitude and flexibility to deal with some of these issues. And that's why one of my slides shows the other part of the multiple use statute that doesn't get invoked so often, the discussion of national interest and um, harmonious and coordinated management. Right, so I think the multiple use law is a bit an antiquated, but when you think about a lot of our other federal environmental statutes, they are forward looking. And we had this discussion at break that is it really the laws and the regulations that are at the problem or, or is it the implementation of these statutes? And maybe it gets back into the sort of political short sightedness that we're focused right now on the next how many days before the midterms? Right, the next political election, and so forth. But I would argue that a lot of our federal land statutes, like NEPA, NIFMA, and others, allow us to take the long view. There's nothing, there's nothing closing that option on us. 
Now, if I had to do it all over again, you know, I think I might write those statutes differently. And we could have a discussion at break about whether or not it's a good idea to convene another public lands law review commission to sort of disentangle these federal land statutes. There's been some discussion of that. There's been some criticism, of course, you know, like can we, if we're really concerned about ecological integrity, a species by species approach and resilience, are these old laws up to the task? Do we need a new set of tools? And those are all important questions that I obviously don't have a great answer for. I th extractive uses and institutions. I mean, would it take some, it, it sounded like you said certain laws, <laughs> other laws constrain that, other courts yes. constrain that. Aren't you, by extension, saying there would have to be something that constrained it to make, to real, to make real the potential of those Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I don't have a problem with the constraining of multiple use management. And I don't even like framing it that way because I've, I've basically referenced, you know, the Endangered Species Act shall not jeopardize a listed species or the mandate to provide diversity of plant and animal communities. I mean, m my preference would be would be to see those mandates as goals and objectives rather than constraints, worthwhile goals. Talk about bringing ethics into the discussion. Talk about the ethical framework of the Endangered Species Act. I think we all agree that it could be implemented in a better way, but there's the, that sort of ethical framework in those statutes. What I was saying about, I, I guess I'm somewhere, I'm a pragmatist when it comes to this uh, I, there's nothing in multiple use, in that definition of multiple use I showed you, that is going to be used to compel an agency to do anything. I think that argument is done. After Sierra Club v. Hardin, after those cases that I showed you. But at the same time, I'm not saying that this is a, um, not an important statute. All of that other stuff, the impairment, the coordinated management, the national interest, I think some of that language today is as relevant as it's ever been. And we have what we've done is placed on top of the Multiple Use Act more substantive and enforceable laws, and it kind of gives us a sense of how much decision-making space you all have on a daily basis. Okay, thanks.